Hi everyone, thank you so much for watching this presentation on performance-based funding in higher education. I'm Natalia Vasquez-Bodkin and this presentation is a program evaluation for the purpose of redesign of the PBF model as a whole and not just one component. Performance-based funding is also known as outcome-based funding or outcome-based education where institutions are incentivized to adopt behaviors that will result in higher student achievement. The policy uses a formula to allocate state funding to public colleges and universities based on student outcomes. Historically, public institutes absorbed policies that incentivize student enrollment funded by taxpayer dollars. In contrast, the PBF model shifts a portion of these dollars from an enrollment-based model to an outcome-based model. The original intent behind the PBF model was to make institutes more competitive and accountable for their outcomes. The financial incentives are determined by comparing specific indicators of performance. Thus, the institute and internal stakeholders are ultimately expected to work both smarter and harder to earn performance funding in order to continue operations, innovate, and expand. Policymakers are encouraged to incorporate performance funding into their state policies because it is known to improve productivity by funding the amount learned instead of the time served. Among many reported harmful unintended consequences, two main impacts were the most prevalent. First, there are restrictions in the admissions process for underprepared students. And second, a decline in academic rigor and standards. Thus, the focus of this program evaluation is to make design recommendations for institutes that will internally rectify these unintended impacts while promoting accountability and transparency by supporting the institute in the pursuit of providing equitable, accessible, and excellent high-quality education to underprepared students while increasing student retention and completion rates in order to receive consistent and sufficient funding for institutional sustainability. Evidence suggests institutes that are most affected by the PBF model are predominantly black institutes, Hispanic serving institutes, and minority serving institutes. The PBF policies have been linked to potentially exacerbating the divide between individuals who have access to quality education and those who didn't have access by pulling funding from struggling institutes. Equity and inclusion have historically been a privilege only provided to those with the means to access it. It is important to remain cognizant of the consequences, whether intended or unintended, when establishing policies that will potentially affect underprivileged demographics. Unfortunately, there is an overall lack of research and documented analysis that focus solely on the PBIs, HSIs, and MSIs and the demographics they serve. Thus, further research is needed in this area in order to properly assess the impacts on these specific communities and student populations. For the purpose of furthering this evaluative process, I will be using existing data to support the proposed redesign of the PBF policies in higher education and rectify the unintended impacts while focusing on institutional behavioral changes that benefit underprivileged and underprepared students. In order to properly make recommendations to remedy the unintended impacts of the original PBF model, the original framework, Outcome-Based Education, or OBE, design must remain as the underlying theoretical framework. OBE is an educational theory that bases each component of the educational system around short, mid, and long-term outcomes. This theory focuses on student learning outcomes, or SLOs, and develops curricula that is based on best practices. Moreover, in order to create sustainable interventions that will remedy the unintended outcomes, a complete understanding and implementation of the theory of change must be incorporated into each intervention. 
It is appropriate to use a TOC design to evaluate PBF because this framework explains how activities are understood in order to produce a series of results that contribute to achieving the final intended impacts. The TOC framework will assist in implementing these interventions because it will assist in identifying the links between the objectives and activities beforehand to create a tight plan. While PBF is modeled based on the OBE framework, which focuses primarily on outcomes, I believe the negative unintended impacts are due to the lack of emphasis on the short, mid, and long-term impacts that result in positive outcomes. If the PBF model is to remain sustainable in design, then it needs to assess both the impacts and the outcomes and the relationship between the two. While an outcome can be predefined and caused and can be measured objectively, impacts are subjective in nature and are dependent on personal experience. It is appropriate to incorporate a mix of evaluative frameworks formative evaluation, outcome effectiveness evaluation, and impact evaluation. A formative evaluation method ensures that a program activity is feasible, appropriate, and acceptable before it is fully implemented. This is imperative to incorporate, particularly for this program evaluation, because I am making recommendations for a modification to the current PBF model due to the unintended impacts that resulted in the decline in academic rigor and standards. To address this, a formative assessment will be applied. This will provide for a continual cycle of feedback and improvement to make instruction and curriculum impactful and effective. Next, outcome effectiveness evaluation method measures the program's effects in the target population by assessing the progress. This framework is significant to the effectiveness of the entire program because it is the founding principle and motivating force to the institute securing funds. Finally, impact evaluation assesses the program's effectiveness in achieving its ultimate goals. This piece is crucial because the PBF program evaluation will attempt to correct the attitudes of the internal stakeholders by providing short-term financial incentives for long-term impact. The design of all three evaluation frameworks is in alignment with the design of the PBF model and policies. The PBF policy is a multi-layered process that will be implemented in various phases. Throughout the life cycle of this program, these frameworks will provide a broader understanding of the impacts and, while, and whether they have indeed rectified the outlined situation or if further and continual modifications need to be made. All institutional activities and programs that are in alignment with the st strategic plan will be required to evaluate participants. Facilitators can choose their method of evaluation and assessment based on the appropriate nature and scope of the program, activity, or intervention and their desired outcomes. Facilitators will have the option to choose between the following mixed methods. Observational, survey, interviews, or documented analysis. The appropriate use of quasi-experimental and observational research methods will assist in successfully assessing this program and its longevity. A quasi-experimental design is consistent with budget constraints. The quasi-experimental design requires facilitators to pre-assess. Quasi-experimental is one of the most appropriate methods of data collection because it accounts for attrition. Attrition is the number of students who leave the institute program, activity, intervention, or class. Attrition is inevitable in higher education from semester to semester or year to year. It is important that the data accounts for this rate and yet is not affected by it. Next, a cross-sectional design method, which is a type of observational design, is also a cost-effective way to collect data. In a cross-sectional study, the investigator measures the outcome and the exposures in the study's participants at the same time. Participants are selected based on the inclusion and exclusion criteria set for the study, and once the participants have been selected, 
the investigator follows a study to assess the exposure and outcomes. Specifically, this research design emphasizes using pools of participants who differ but share in commonalities, like college readiness. The evaluative question will determine the nature of the evaluation design and when to collect data. Due to the large nature and scope of this evaluation, a mixed use of evaluative designs will be used to collect data. Status design will help to determine what is happening in the here and now. This requires an observation at the current time. This design will be helpful when assessing activities and programs effectiveness. Change design will attempt to determine the impact, action, or intervention on a group of individuals. This design will be implemented in the form of a campus-wide climate survey in order to gauge the institutional attitude. Finally, a comparison design will be used to determine how programs have affected one group versus another group or one program versus another. This design will be specifically helpful in assessing transitional programs and comparing its effectiveness to the population who didn't qualify or chose to opt out. For purposeful, systematic, and careful collection and analysis of data, for the use of documenting the effectiveness and impact of the PBF redesign model and programs associated, a mixed approach of summative measures and formative measures will inform the process. A formative approach will be implemented for the activities and programs that will be implemented in multiple parts, phases, areas, and times. This approach will examine various aspects of the ongoing program in order to make changes and improvements as the program is being implemented. A summative approach will be implemented for the purpose of do documenting the results of the individual programs and or activities in the proposed PBF redesign model. The results of the summative evaluation will specify the program and activities and outcome status and conditions for accountability. Performance indicators such as participation rates, attitudes, prevalence, retention, attrition rates, and completion rates will be gathered through an annual assessment progress report compiled by each department and division and consolidated as an institutional report. Performance indicators will provide guidance and facilitation over the execution of the strategic plan put in place during year one. It will also provide guidance for assessment procedures. Simplicity is key when designing performance-based policies. Having too many metrics can make implementation more difficult and cause data collection and reporting to become diluted. Rather, a smaller set of measurable outcomes is important for long-term political and institutional support. Metrics measure and track the correlation between progress and achievement. The following chart above indicates the metrics that will be measured for this redesign. The overall program evaluative process will be placed in the hands of the internal stakeholders. Essentially, they will decide if the redesigned PBF model is successful. Routine tracking of program activities will need regular monitoring by the measures and goals outlined on an ongoing basis. It is the responsibility of the internal stakeholders in charge of each respective location, program, activity, division, or department to track and produce an annual progress report for the aforementioned measures, indicators, and methods for the purpose of periodic assessment of program effectiveness to the appropriate primary intended users. The assessment and monitoring process should remain internal and executed by the internal stakeholders at the end of each academic year. Specifically, the primary intended users, the subset of internal stakeholders, are responsible for focusing primarily on seeing the evaluative process through and motivating the process. The primary intended users are those who are selected to work with the evaluators throughout the evaluation to focus the evaluation, participate in making design and method decisions, and interpret the results to assure that the evaluation is useful, meaningful, relevant, and credible. Overall, institutions that have documented unintended consequences of the original PBF model 
can utilize this proposed redesign of the PBF model to potentially rectify two of the reported harmful impacts. First, restrictions in the admissions process for underprepared students, and two, a decline in academic rigor and standard. The logic model on slide four outlines the anticipated outcomes of the inputs and activities if implemented slowly and consistently allowing institutes to naturally shift into a climate of internal reform, restructure, and reorganization. The following anticipated outcomes will be in the process of rectification by year three through six. An increase in college readiness through interventions, programs, and activities. An increase in retention and completion rates. An embedded culture of assessment and transparency an improved admissions process that promotes equity and inclusion, and strengthened integrity and academic rigor, and an increase in performance-based funding. The analysis of the original performance-based funding model 1.0 and the revised performance-based funding model 2.0 came from the information provided through literature reviews, case studies, program reports, and existing data compiled from 24 different sources from 28 states within the United States. Through this extensive process of analysis, there was one shared commonality among all community colleges and universities that implemented both PBF models, both PBF 1.0 and 2.0. The persistent presence of those two negative impacts, even when the model was modified, PBF 2.0, the unintended impacts were still present. The only intervention that proved successful was the inclusion of performance incentives for underrepresented students. Thus, these incentives were written into the proposed redesigned PBF model. Nonetheless, it is not enough to provide an institution with financial incentives in order for them to actually carry out their mission, vision, and values. Rather, the climate has to shift entirely. The internal climate of an institute, one built on anything other than transparency, equity, inclusion, and accountability, leaves room for internal stakeholders to lack in multiple areas that pertain to integrity and honesty. That is the greater issue that needs to be tackled. Historically, institutions that are affected most by the PBF model serve students of color and are categorically predominantly black institutes Hispanic-serving institutes, and minority-serving institutes. These demographics are systematically underserved, underprivileged, underrepresented, and underprepared. While many state policies attempt to curtail the unintended consequences of rising selectivity criteria by adding incentives for institutions to serve historically disadvantaged students, not enough research has been conducted solely on these institutes and the demographics they serve. Rather, most of the states and institutes that did not seek to reform their policies, they opted to remain with the enrollment-based model that provides incentives solely on the basis of seats. This does not incentivize institutes to strive for academic excellence and provide their students with a quality education. The enrollment model places more emphasis on getting students in the door, but not enough on completion. Among the institutes that have seen success with the implementation of the PBF model, Ohio, Tennessee, and Indiana, these states have the lowest average of Black or Hispanic students within their institutes. Thus, the gaps in the existing literature suggest that further research is needed in this area if the PBF model is to be successful in other areas that do serve this demographic. Additionally, there is also an overall lack of research that examines the costs and benefits of performance-based funding. For the purpose of this program evaluation and the proposed redesign of the PBF models, policies, and activities associated, all of the internal work was carried out by the internal stakeholders. While that is ideal, there are limitations in expertise that may be circumvented by external assessment. This would require an unaccounted for financial expense. In conclusion, there is a myriad of existing research that evaluates performance-based funding and the negative unintended impacts associated. 
While the consequences of an unsuccessful implementation are grave and damaging to the strides made to diversify, provide equity, and make institutes more inclusive and accessible to all, it is nonetheless more a reason to continue making modifications to the PBF model. The policy in nature is pragmatic, effective, and worthwhile. With the diligent help of institutions, policymakers, and program evaluators, the PBF model can be successfully redesigned and implemented to have no unintended consequences.